This is Jessica, and you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. I am joined today by a very special guest. Uh, this is Ken Campbell, um, Bloomkey family friend from old, and um, an actor who you've definitely seen in many, many things. Ken, thank you so much for coming on my uh, my Weird Dumb Show. Well, thank you, Jessica. Thank you for having me. I couldn't be more pleased to be here. Oh, good. Um, so do you want to speak a little bit to your, uh, your career up until now so people will know who you are because they... Definitely will. <laughs> Again, so Ken and my... Did you know my dad go to high school together or you and my uncle? No, no, your uncle. My uncle. Your dad's way, way older than oh. me. <laughs> um, but, my, but your dad was my father's, the manager of his basketball team mm-hmm. in high school in the 60s. Gotcha. And uh, when I was uh, but a wee lad. <laughs> and um, he was college age, you know, very uh-huh. soon, through much of the 60s. And I was, you know, in short pants. <laughs> Um, but your, uh, your uncle Don and I went to Southern Illinois University for a brief, uh, stint. <laughs> brief a, and fun, a, a, question mark? A brief couple of semesters. <laughs> um, and I'll just say that, uh, there was less, uh, criminal, uh-huh. uh, element in my, uh, stay at Southern Illinois. Your uncle was less fortunate. That tracks once in a while my dad will like send us somebody will dig up a picture of like some bloomkey somewhere was arrested and it's like in the like elmhurst newspaper (laughs) it's uh the police blotter had a yeah a good relationship with the bloomkey man (laughs) um you know so my my dad went to york high school and he Mm -hmm. always used to brag about how he was like I don't know if they won state or whatever. I did not find out until maybe five years ago. He was the fucking manager of the... I thought he was on the team. I thought he was a basketball player. (laughs) Well, you know, the the manager's needed. Uh uh, You know, him and George Andrews, Mm -hmm. uh, both of them uh, were my dad's manager for the York teams. And then when my dad left to go to the University of Illinois, Uh uh, where he was an assistant coach for seven years... Uh, George Andrews followed him there and went to the University of Illinois. Oh, I don't think and, I knew that. And did but did your dad also go to the University of Western Illinois? Western Illinois. Yeah, he went to Western, right? Which so. I looked at that school and he strongly discouraged me from going there for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, so that's some <laughs> Bloomkey family history. That's family stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> so, well, I'm I first met you. So you were like always a name around my house. So I first met you. I was maybe six years old, seven years old, and it was right after Home Alone had come out. And um, I remember my family came out to L.A., and we all went out to dinner, and my brother and I were so nervous to meet you. We were like, <laughs> this is a big celebrity. Like, I hope he's nice to us. You should have been. I, 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 I mean, we're <laughs> rightfully so, I think. So you were the, the Santa Claus in... I'm sorry, I asked you to introduce yourself, and then yeah, talked right well, over you. Uh, the first... Uh, no, no, no. You, <laughs> You gave the mini intro uh-huh. to my larger TGF. intro. So, um, yeah, my I was at Second City, and um, I was uh, working with, um, you know, doing improv and sketch comedy, and mm-hmm. we were opening shows. And so, uh, in the meantime, auditions started to pop up and come together, and then and projects. And so, anyway, uh, one of them was this film called Home Alone, <laughs> and I auditioned for Santa Claus, and... Um, you know, at first uh, I didn't hear anything for months, and then they said, well, you didn't get Santa, they called me, but you got the elf. And I go, oh, okay, well, at least I'm in the movie. Uh-huh. And, you know, the elf had, you know, one or two lines. I don't um, remember an elf at all. Well, she was played by the cinematographer's girlfriend <laughs> at the time. <laughs> uh, and, um, well, and what happened was, after a week or two, they called me back and said, no, nope, you know what, you got Santa, you got it. And so I was pretty excited, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of my friends had heard, hey, I heard you're in a John Candy movie, you're in a, because it, at yeah. this point, it's, Home Alone means nothing. Right, right, right. Macaulay Culkin. Was no one. M- 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 Macaulay Culkin. Mulkey Culkin? No, you got it. No, 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 Macaulay? no, the way, uh, it's Eddie Murphy, so Macaulay oh. Culkin, that's it. <laughs> Macaulay Culkin, no one knew who Macaulay Culkin was. <laughs> so, uh... I'd say, I'd say, I hear you're in that movie with John Candy. I'd say, yeah, but I, I don't have a scene with him. I just have a scene with the kid. Uh-huh. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I shot the, this uh, this scene with this kid who was just angelic. He was so young. And uh-huh. His skin was translucent. <laughs> and he, you know, 
uh, he was just a, uh, adorable, but um, he would go, uh, you know, I just want my family. Ba- oh, I messed up. <laughs> Give me five dollars and I'll get it right this time. <laughs> so he was bribing the director, Chris Columbus, because he knew that they had to release him at a certain time for child labor laws. Oh, so he no. would he would get extra money out of the, the director. For to get the lines right when he could get them right all along, and he just did it to make pocket change. It's a genius. It was. It was ingenious. Oh my god, that's um, hysterical. So yeah, the, it so, was. If you don't remember, um, in in Home Alone, there's one part where Macaulay Culkin, mm-hmm. who is the titular Home Alone child, mm-hmm. goes to Santa Claus to wish for his family back, and Santa is what getting off work. Yeah, he's done with the. The, it's Christmas Eve. He's <laughs> finished with his kids for the year, and he gives them Tic Tacs. And, and you know he's just he's but he doesn't have anything with him. He doesn't have the candy canes. He doesn't. <laughs> and um, you know the uh, well was uh, the cinematographer's girlfriend said you know he's right over there, and uh, so you see me get the parking ticket. And you're right though. You have to remember that there are many people listening to this who have maybe haven't seen that movie or are too young for it. I mean, I remember I watched it. Uh, I have a niece and nephew who are about nine, and I think they're about to be nine and twelve. And we, I remember watching it with my my nephew when he was like seven. Watch yeah. it, and he laughed, but is also terrified by the very terrifying scenes of torture uh, of robbers getting physically tortured yeah. by a child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a little bit of a film for older kids than mm-hmm. you kind of might remember. But it also is rather foul, you know. Yeah. They're using bad language and, uh, you know, they leave their kid behind. I mean, there's a lot of things that are kind of <laughs> incorrect by today's standards. Right. But we shot that film. It was in 89, I believe. So it was 30 years ago, Jeez. now that we're at 19, uh, because it came out in 90. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's that's almost wild. 30 years ago. And so it was my first film, and, and it was here we are shooting in Wilmette, and it was uh, <laughs> downtown Wilmette. Is all the lights are beautiful, but I didn't know how to drive a stick. And they taught me, and they tried to teach me how to drive, and the whole time I'm running through the scene, I'm thinking, okay, put the clutch in, you know, <laughs> let it out, put the do this and this. And so you'll see in the scene, I don't get it in gear, and the thing goes, good gunk, good gunk. And then I go, <laughs> Son of a, <laughs> and they and I hit the thing. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't say son of a, <laughs> but they kept it in. They kept in the me not being able to get my own car in gear. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that was an improv. Uh, that's true. It was. Well, I, like I said, I had to dub in son of a. <laughs> <laughs> it was something completely different. But uh, it was the, the funny. Actually, the funny thing within the funny thing is I got we get the whole scene right. It was beautiful. I get in the car. I put it in gear. And I get it around, and I have to get it around the camera. The camera's right there. Uh-huh. And um, and so I get it in gear, get it around the camera, and then they go, Kenny, that was great, <laughs> but we got to go back to one and do it all over again. You forgot to put your headlights on. <laughs> so I forgot to put my headlights on. And uh, so I had to do it again, and then I then that's when I messed it up. Cause I, didn't, I wasn't wow. thinking about what McCulky Culkin was saying. <laughs> I was just going bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Yep. Now I'm gonna drive the car. Focusing on the car. Wow, movie making <laughs> sure is glamorous. It is. Um, so what else? So Herman's Head was another big. Which yeah. for some reason, the last five years, that's been a cultural touch point. I've heard a lot about. I don't know. Like, hmm. it was it was on for a season, a couple seasons, three seasons, three seasons. I'm sorry, that was um, rude of me. Well, no, no, because what happened was we did two seasons. We did 25 episodes for each of the two first seasons. Mm-hmm. Then they moved us, and we were on because we were on Sunday nights opposite. Um, we were on Sunday nights opposite uh, Married with Children mm. for the first two years, and then we um, got moved to Thursday night opposite a guy named a psychologist named Frazier that I can't imagine anybody wanted to <laughs> mm-hmm. see. No. Because we had all no. the T and A on Herman's sure, head. Sure, sure, sure. So they moved both <laughs> us and In Living Color, and we both died a quick death. That was it. Huh. Yeah. Never thought In Living Color and Herman's head would be, <laughs> would have gone down to the ship together. We were. We were Fox shows. We were also on Sunday nights together, and we were moved together, too. So So Fox show, would you have been on Same Night as Simpsons? Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's kind of a cool claim to fame. 
Um, and then was so, Armageddon X or was... Well, no, um, well, Herman's Head... So Herman's Head brought me out to... The timeline is like 91, Herman's Head got picked up. Mm-hmm. And I was at Second City. And I didn't think it would ever get picked up, but it did. Mm-hmm. So that was it. That changed everything. And I had to move out to L.A. and, you know, had to, uh, you know. <laughs> um, but it was great. And uh, it was a great start to my career. So when and while I was out shooting Herman's Head... I guess it was the second season. I had an audition with Harold Ramis for uh, yeah. Groundhog Day. So now um, I'm I've been way off my cabin. That's okay. So you're very uh, loud. <laughs> so uh, that's true. I project. So um, I had this meeting with Harold. It went very well. But the one of the reasons I was hired was because I was a I still had an apartment in Chicago, and so movies can do something that's called a local hire. And so if they have a job, they can, they don't have to pay an actor a certain amount of money over if they can hire him locally, and he's an Illinois guy. Oh. So I got hired as an Illinois actor. I didn't know that. And, is that filmed um, in Woodstock, Illinois? It was filmed in Woodstock. Mm-hmm. That's right. So um, I ended up getting two days of pay out of it because we didn't get it all shot in the first day. Uh, but we, but that was a kind of a landmark film because yeah. it was. Uh, as we know, it all turned out to be a, this. It was a landmark film, but for me, it was because of working with other Second City guys like Harold Ramis and yeah. Bill Murray. That was a dream come true. Oh, it's great movie. It holds up well. And then Armageddon's and next. Armageddon was a little bit later. There's a few more smaller parts in between. Uh-huh. And I also had my own. Uh, I had a series of my own on Fox. Oh, Local Heroes. Local Heroes. I remember which, that. Uh, yeah, which didn't run very long, but. It was about two years of development after Herman's Head, and uh, I think it was 96 when it got on the air, and, um, you know, we, we shot seven episodes, uh-huh. and, uh, and it, it just didn't go very well. It was, uh, there was a change of, of uh, the guard at Fox, mm-hmm. and they were, um, they were not as interested in the previous uh you know, uh, administration shows. Uh, so we kind of got the bums rush from that. It's so wild how much about whether a show is successful or not is based on not the quality of the show. Like everything yeah. besides that of the politics and all the shit that goes beyond goes on behind the behind the scenes that we never see. We being blaming. It's true. It's true. And uh, you know this this version that, or this show that I did, you know, had at times well. There's a couple different showrunners for this, but a show I did later called Baby Bob, which yes. was a talking baby show, which we can't have enough of. Uh huh. Sure. As far as I'm concerned, really lacking. That show had everybody from Hugh Wilson, who's no longer with us, God rest in peace. But I mean, huge. He created KRP. I mean, you know, the oh. huge people who were big time writers and stuff. That and they just they fired them. They didn't want their stuff. They didn't. They weren't good enough for the talking baby. <laughs> um, but uh, eventually, a guy named Michael Saltzman came along, and, and he was good enough for the talking baby. And we actually rang two half seasons out of that character. Two half seasons? Two half, because we picked up for 13, and we did 13, and then they picked us up for 13 again. So we were a mid-season replacement. Oh, gotcha. And, they, and we did 13. or what, No, we did seven. I think we did seven. What and was then the, So then they picked us up for 13 again. But we only shot like nine of them. What was the premise of that show besides the baby talked? You don't need anything more than that. Okay. <laughs> that's that's pretty much all. Um, so there, I don't think there was ever any like uh, explanation of why the baby talked. Could the parents hear the baby talking, or yes, was it like a Garfield thing? Okay, everybody could hear the baby. And talk. he sounded like a <clears throat> Chicago guy. Which was he sounded like this uh-huh. right here. Approximately. It was not approximately. He <laughs> sounded like this. Oh, you didn't have a special baby Bob voice. <laughs> Bob the baby voice. No, this is it. <laughs> I'm a talking baby. Wow. There you it's, go. You transported me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was that was really quite an exceptional run, though, because, and I don't want to bore you with stuff like this, uh, but anyway, it mm-hmm. was pretty uh, unbelievable how it went down. Um, it was an advertisement at first for freeinternet.com, and. We wow, did. that is a 90s concept if I ever heard one. Freeinternet.com. Yeah, freeinternet.com. 
and we did a number of commercials, uh-huh. and they aired during the NBA Finals, during the NBA the playoffs. And then we finally we did a series of spots with Shaq, and the the ads got so much attention during the NBA Finals. This is during the Bulls during the Bulls second run, right? So this what is years of ninety six. This is ninety. This is before ninety six. Oh, okay. Like ninety four. Oh, okay. Ninety ninety. The end of Herman's head, kind of bridging ninety five, uh-huh. ninety four, ninety five. So maybe it wasn't the Bulls. I'm getting mixed up. <laughs> but anyway, it was it, the they aired during the NBA Finals, and it, it, they did so well. The commercials did so well that they weren't able to keep. They they couldn't. The 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 site would crash every time they showed an ad. Because they showed it to tens of millions of people, but they couldn't handle the traffic on Uh the website. So they literally went out of business because the ads were so (laughs) successful. So then the guys who created the Talking Baby, which they admittedly, it was ripped off of Conan O'Brien. Remember when Conan used to do President Clinton and and it was uh, Robert Smigel was doing the the lips Yeah, so it was like a still picture and then like the lips were blurred out and it was just somebody else's lips talking. That's right. And so they did the same thing, but they had it was a motion. So it was like an actual film of a baby and then they would just put my mouth over the the baby. It was your actual mouth? It was my actual mouth. So you had to like shave and... Get it all precision shaving. <laughs> um, there was a point where they made gums for my teeth to go over my teeth, uh-huh. and then I was like, "Listen, I can't talk like this. There's, there's, there's these things are in my mouth." And the guy, the head of Viacom, goes, "Honestly, can I can't tell a difference? <laughs> can anyone tell a difference? No, we can't tell. A can you tell a difference? I, I honestly can't. Really, you can't, you can't tell the difference in my voice. So anyway." Um, so this thing, so they went bankrupt, but they gave the guys who created the character the rights to the character in court. The judge gave them back the rights to the character. Usually the company would keep right. the, the rights to the character, but they don't. Like, you know, like the Jolly Green Giant or whatever. So they sold the film. They sh- sold the idea to Viacom, and Viacom sold to CBS, and we shot at Paramount. We did two years of these shows, and then it all went away, uh-huh. right? And then they sold it again to Quiznos. And so he was the spokes baby for Quiznos for like a year. But the, the problem was it was his own success, his own. I'm talking about <laughs> the talking baby as if it's a living entity. But his own success was his problem because yeah. that, that Quiznos guy who brought that campaign, the creative guy, got then hired away by McDonald's, Uh. and so they dropped the campaign once again because the new administration never wants to have the old administration. So once again, I should still be a talking baby. Oh, my God. Although I'm currently a talking bear for for, uh, Chrysler. I'm uh, also a talking dog for uh, Infinity. Uh, Not Infinity, uh, not the car. for um, No, for Intel, not Infinity. What am I saying? (laughs) And then I got the new Talking Bear coming up. Yeah. Which I'm very oh, excited. Really nice working to plug in that, that new segue. movie. It was very good. It was good. called a segue, uh-huh. Jessica. I'm so sorry. This is sorry. embarrassing. <clears throat> no, but um, <laughs> very excited about this new project that's uh, coming out uh, in March, March 15th. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's called uh, Wonder Park. Wonder Park. And I'm playing Boomer the Bear, and he's a big old blue guy, and... Uh, very exciting. Uh, big. It's Paramount again, uh-huh. and it's uh, they're not their first animated feature, but they're kind of trying to really bust into the animation uh, world, and it's just a beautiful film. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's it looks great. It's fun. It's funny. It's the kids are the kids are gonna love it. <laughs> the kids will love it. Isn't there already talk about a series, or am I making that up? I've already, yeah, I've done 29 episodes Wait, of the really? series. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, that's going on at the same time. So that's going to be at, on Nickelodeon. I'm not sure when it premieres, uh-huh. but um, it is concurrent with it. It's similar to what they did with Jimmy Neutron, where they uh, made the film around the same time that they started the series. I bet people with kids know more about that than me. I've heard of Jimmy Neutron. He's got yeah. the tall hair. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got it. 
Yeah. Uh, my kids were right in that Jimmy Neutron pocket. So oh, I'm, I'm <laughs> so aware you're familiar. Of that. And I'm a Mr. Animation now too, Jessica. Yes, you are. Now that I'm Mr. Animation, I you know I throw around words like Jimmy Neutron. Uh huh. And expect everyone to <laughs> to swoon <laughs> at just the mention of a Jimmy right. Neutron. But um, it's interesting. Oh, go ahead. No, I. You go ahead. Well, no, it's just that. Um, so I guess these days, if you're a big star or you're doing a big. Uh, you know, Hollywood movie and you're doing a voiceover as a character, Mm -hmm. oftentimes the ones in the movies don't go and do the TV show. So I'm actually the only cast member from the movie who's slumming it and doing the series as well. So Wow. I can't believe you took something so beneath you, like (laughs) television. (laughs) Well, it's uh, it's been a fun experience. I'm glad to be a part of it. Wait, so when the... um when the seri- the television series comes out, are the voice actors doing imitations of the celebrities? Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Um, so could you, in theory, make a living doing an imitation of one person and just, like, kind of t- getting all, all of their, like, TV spinoffs? Well, okay, so I'm going to say yes. Um, but probably one wouldn't be enough. Mm, mm-hmm, so there are mm-hmm. guys who are incredible at this, yeah. who do it, yes, they do it for a living, but they don't just do it for one guy. So in the movie Christopher Robin that was out earlier uh-huh. last year, um, the guy who does uh, the voice of Winnie the Pooh uh-huh. also does Eeyore, and he has been doing them for years. What's his, okay, so... Jim Cummings is his name. So... My favorite documentary in the entire world is I Know That Voice. And right. so mm-hmm. I'm I, sure he's in there. He definitely is. And yeah, he does yeah. Tigger also. And he holds. Uh, that's what I meant. He does Tigger. He does. He tigger. holds drumsticks through his entire interview. And I just think that's a really good character choice he made for himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a brilliant guy. A yeah. Bril- and a brilliant sound alike guy. There's, you know, there's all the guys who had to, um, all the guys who had to, uh, uh, take up for Mel Blanc after he mm-hmm. died. You know, there's been a, a series of guys, but uh, Bob Bergen is one of the guys who does a lot of, like, Tweety and does a lot of Porky Pig. And mm-hmm. um, But there's just, you know, tons of guys. There's The guy who's doing Jack in the Box right now ain't Jack in the Box. What? Right. Don't so, ruin the magic. So I can tell you, you want to hear a great Jack in the Box story? Yes. So when Is it about E. coli? Because that's the only thing I know when, about Jack when in the, the Box. When E. coli <laughs> happened, Jack in the Box was in trouble. They the, there were kids had perished. They were they were definitely having a problem. They needed a makeover, and so they brought Jack back. And they, that was the big campaign: Jack's back. But they needed a voice for for Jack. So I went in an audition. And this is like the day after the Academy Awards back then. Tom Hanks had just uh, won the Academy Award for Philadelphia, uh-huh. and I walk in to this audition, and I see sitting. And, and, and one of the chairs is Phil Hartman, <gasps> and then the other chair is Tom Hanks. <gasps> and I go, Tom Hanks just won an Oscar, and he's here auditioning <laughs> for the voice of Jack in a Box. So I go to sign in, and I go to sign in. And it says Phil Hartman <laughs> and Jim Hanks. It's his brother Jim, also featured on this documentary. I'm obsessed with. Oh, there you yeah. go. Who did all the running for him? Who does his voice? Yes. Who does Toy Story? Who does you know? But then back then, nobody knew. I mean, some some people, but I had never seen him before. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, Jim Hanks. Okay, well, that makes a little more sense. But the fact was, but Phil, Phil Hartman, Hartman was in there, right? <laughs> so then they end up. Well, you didn't get it. Who got it? Well, the guy gave it to himself. So Dick. <laughs> Dick Siddick, who hired me many times uh-huh. after that, and so he's a great guy. Sure. I, I won't, I won't put anything about. But he, the, the it wasn't his choice. I uh-huh. don't think the the client said, you know what, we like your voice because he had dummied in his voice for oh. cuts, for rough cuts and stuff. And they go, why don't we just use you? So the guy who was hiring got <laughs> the job for twenty years. <laughs> Well, they just fired him a couple of years ago. And this is all, they don't want anybody to know this. Um, so, yeah, you get a little Inside, exclusive. But, all 14 but I tell listeners you this, of this podcast I tell are going to you this. Thrilled. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know who got it. They won't even tell me. When I went to go out and do a commercial for them the other day, they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me even wait around to see who it was. Really? <laughs> wait, why is it such a secret? I don't know. That's just, you know, it's corporate. Uh, yeah. 
corporate uh, shenanigans mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, that and so that whoever that is, it's just a guy imitating the voice of Jack. Uh huh. And you know, so I, I my I'm not good at that. I'm not a bad mimic, but mm-hmm. I'm not a per. I can't. Some guys just that's what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, so Armageddon. Oh yes. Let's talk about Armageddon. Okay. My dad made that was ninety seven. Eight. Ninety eight. Okay, so I was like twelve or thirteen, and my dad was like, "The Bloomkey family is going to see Armageddon." And I was like thirteen. <laughs> I hated everything. I was like, "I hate space." <laughs> And so we went to see, I don't know, I was, I was ornery, and we saw it, and the end was, my mom and I just, like, racking sobs at the end of that movie. Oh, that's great. Ugh. But anyway, my dad, ugh, my dad was so proud of you. Um, uh, so you played Max. Max Leonard. Fucking mm-hmm. nailed it. Are you, oh. are you impressed that I knew that? Just <laughs> off the dome? Pretty good. Yeah, you don't Pretty seem good. as impressed as I need you to. That's fine. I'm writing that down. Um, so you were one of the... Oil men? Yeah, the oil <laughs> What was the premise? So, the premise of the movie is... Or they call them the... Uh, what was it they call them? The... Um, oh, uh, no, I can't even remember. It's been 20 years. Oil, oil boys is not nah, what they... Uh, well, no, yeah, the oil boys. Oil yeah. boys, Let's okay. Let's go with the oil boys. <laughs> I was one of the oil boys. Oil boys. And, so, um, that was... A pr- so, I was... I think I texted you or tweeted you or something like that. I was getting my nails done one day. And I was like about to go on vacation. I was feeling really chill, and the salon had a um, TV playing. And I was like, "Why am I watching a scene with Steve Buscemi in a strip club?" And then I was like, "Fuck, that's Kenny, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> I like, oh. And I forgot that scene existed. And I was oh, like, yeah. "What is happening right now?" <laughs> but God, that was a cool cast. Yeah, Buscemi, Ben Affleck, Bruce Willis. Do you want to spill any dirt on anyone? Peter Stormare. Uh huh. Um, Will Michael Patton, Clark, um, Michael Clark Duncan, Michael Clark Duncan, who was the nicest guy, who's the nicest guy ever. Yeah. And, uh, again, we miss him a lot. Um, well, it's been 20 years. There's not a lot of dirt really that can be, uh, spread. Uh, everybody's been in and out of rehab and attempted <laughs> suicide and they've all done everything. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> so when, when you come to a movie, so that's a, a Michael Bay flick, um, when you come into that, is there a lot of room to let you improv, or is it ver- a very... Oh. Well, that's why I got hired, was because uh, of improv. Mm-hmm. So, um, which is usually the reason I get, imp- I get hired. Uh, Baby Bob, certainly, because my mm-hmm. first, the first time I did that commercial, that freeinternet.com, we did... I don't want to exaggerate. But it was more than thirty demos. We did more than thirty of them. Wow! And half of them, I just went off and did my <laughs> own thing. You know, um, I don't even know if we could count them. So when, so when, uh, when I looked through the script of Armageddon, Max only had one word, which was Harry when he died. In the whole movie. In the whole movie. So I improvised every line I had in that movie. Oh my god! I had no idea. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So uh, the reason is Michael Bay. So I did a commercial for him, and he he directs commercials as well. And he mm. he directed one of the most famous commercials of all time, uh, which was the Got Milk with the uh, Aaron Burr and um, that. Oh whole my thing. god! That was Michael yeah, Bay. Yeah, Michael Bay directed that. So uh, he directed commercials, and it was one of the ways he made his mark. And he kind of always went back to that. Even after Armageddon, I went and I did a Mercedes commercial for him. Huh. But I did this was for MCI, which is a time thing, right? Oh, MCI yeah. was a phone like AT and T. So, um, and I, you know, I improvised, and he, you know, I cracked them up and made them laugh. So I was doing this other movie up in Chico, California. I get back, and they say they're looking for you for a Bruce Willis movie. I go, a Bruce Willis movie? Yeah, that's weird. And so <laughs> I, they won't let you read the script. You have to go down and read the script at the office. So, okay, so it's uh, it's red. The script is red, so nobody can copy it. Oh, uh-huh. And it's, uh, you know, it's got, uh, it's stamped so that it's, you know, nobody can uh, steal it. And so I'm reading through it, and I'm, I'm like, there's nothing in here for me. And they've given me, the sides they've given me is Steve Buscemi's, sides oh. from uh actually the only part that was written that i did do was uh in the 
and well, and nobody knows the movie. Uh, there's a part where I'm we're getting uh, a psychological testing, and um, oh, he's in the room with the foam. Yeah, the foam things. Yeah, 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 and um, oh, now I've completely forgotten. The whole thing. What what was I talking about, Jess? The only line that oh, you oh, so, got it. So anyway, yes. Buscemi, they gave me to read for the audition Steve Buscemi's line, uh-huh. which included that stuff about haggis. There's stuff about haggis. They talk about haggis in that, but it's stuff that I lifted from that part of the movie because he wasn't saying it anymore. Oh. And then, but then I added my own jokes. So, like, you know, I said, like, that'll put some hair on your ass or something like that. I threw that in there. But the haggis was part, that was all Steve Buscemi. So I auditioned with his lines. Huh. And then when I got on set, I could just do kind of whatever I wanted. That's really, but that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Well, I guess you're a professional improviser. That's literally your job. It's, it's less pressure than having to memorize your lines. I mean, oh, you that's know. actually a good point. It, uh, it was really phenomenal because my first day shooting, I had to shoot this thing with my, the woman playing my mother. Uh-huh. And um, they would just, so they would just set the camera and me sitting at the table, and I would just go and go and go until I heard, and they go, okay, reload, and then I would go, and then they would just let me go again. Really? Until the camera was just, yeah. And then a lot of that, none of that, hardly any of that stuff made it to the movie. <laughs> but, I mean, it was just, it was the best working experience of my life mm-hmm. because I was just let loose to do anything I wanted. I even was, they had me directing some of my reaction shots when I'm in the, in the thing, uh-huh. grilling that. Uh-huh. He was over working on the other stage, so he goes, just just direct it yourself. Wow. So I was calling action and cut on my own scenes. Is this your death scene? In the No, before oh. it. Oh, okay. But, but right right before I'm sorry, I mean, spoiler alert, it's on Armageddon. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> but right before it, I mean, yes, heading into that uh-huh. sequence, you know. So uh, how I ran afoul of them, I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> So you uh, you kind of came up in Second City. So you were there in seventies, early eighties, eighties, nineties, nineties. Tell me, Eight, late eighties, <laughs> early nineties, eighty eight to ninety. Oh really? Oh, I thought it was earlier than that. Um, so you came up. Second City was very much a boys club when you were coming up. Would you say that is? Well, it had that. Uh, it had the reputation. It had that rep, being, yeah. But by the time, so my fourth, I did four shows there, uh-huh. and my fourth show. I was in a cast that was half men, half women. And, oh. that, and that was the first one that I knew of. Mm-hmm. There may have been others before, but <laughs> I knew that we were sort of... So we were. I was on the cusp. We were turning it already. Uh-huh. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's... I don't know. Where were you going with that? Cause it, uh, just ge- a general conversation well, about... Well, no, because it is... I mean, it was. I mean, yeah. you have Belushi, and you got, you know, it's a it's a bunch of uh, of guys cracking wise. But it was also... It's always very smart. Always had to do with the newspaper and mm-hmm. about um, the, the the news of the day. And, you know, where ground groundlings are more, like, character-based mm-hmm. and, like, I'm Mr. Refrigerator Man, you know? Wow. Wow. Um, then Second City would be more about how do we, you know, uh, you know, uh, how do we uh, deal with refrigerators in society? You know what I mean? <laughs> uh-huh. So it was more like social. And I'm not saying it was better or no. that it was smarter or that. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, you know that, but it's just different. Yeah. And, and so those people come out of Groundlings. You can see them, and they really play with the character. Like look like at Melissa McCarthy. She's right. so brilliant and so. Unbelievably funny, but that's nothing stuff like that we would have never done at Second City. Oh, that's interesting. I don't think I ever knew the sort of delineation. So when you come out to LA, was it sort of like a Jets and Shark situation of like Second City alums versus Groundlings? No, n- not really. I uh, we kind of just did our own thing, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I think people have studied back and forth. But I didn't, you know, not nobody really was like, they suck and we're cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, there wasn't anything like that, really. And then, and then uh, all those people really early on started kind of together. And they're all under the umbrella of Josephine Forsberg. So it's all, they're even extended cousins I- anyway. Uh-huh. You know, because Lorraine Newman is a, is a cousin who is, you know, at my voiceover agency. But she's a groundling, but she knows all these Second City people mm-hmm. from her background. Yeah. Know? Um, 
but that's part of the great thing of LA is that, you know, after all these years, I can count Lorraine Newman as a friend of mine and mm-hmm. a and a colleague. And you know, I was I, I was back when I was smoking. I was I was in Beverly Hills at a stop sign. <laughs> I looked over and there's Lorraine in the next car. She goes, Hi. Ah, <laughs> uh, Lorraine Newman. I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no. As you're waiting for the bus. <laughs> yeah, right. But we had, there, there are, the, you know, there's tons of great people in this town, f- fun people to work with, people who are your heroes forever. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, pretty interesting. I've been here now almost 30 years. It is. It's almost 30 years, 28 years now. That's wild. Yeah. So what do you like voiceover work more or less than on film work or do you have a preference? Well, <clears throat> I think that uh I really like the most I, I, I uh, on stage. I like um I like to be in front of an audience. Mm-hmm. I feed off the audience's energy. Um I don't really like uh, creativity in a bubble and uh, voiceover I don't particularly it's not that I don't like it. Mm-hmm. It's that I get jazzed by people laughing. Mm-hmm. So, like, I was in film school at Columbia College in Chicago, and mm-hmm. we were editing, you know, 10-minute films. It took six months to edit them and get them put together, and then hopefully you'd be at a student screening and you'd be able to show it to a couple hundred people, you know, once, and then it'd be back to shooting another movie and editing. Uh-huh. And then we... Somebody said, you, uh, you want to learn how to write. I was, I was having problems writing, and this guy said, you want to learn how to write, go to Second City. You'll mm-hmm. never have a problem writing again. Well, we went, and it was the immediate laughter. The, and then we started doing shows with a group, and it was like, we'd go on stage without having to sit in a room for six months, mm-hmm. get a suggestion, everyone's laughing, and then five minutes later, you're having a beer, and everyone's coming up to you, and you know, it was just, uh, it was so infectious. It yeah. Was, you know, you just couldn't beat it. Yeah. So t- so we're living in kind of an interesting time with regard to entertainment, because with YouTube and Vimeo, like Twitter, mm-hmm. it's really accessible more than it ever has yeah, been in yeah, the past. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that is generally for the better, or mm. do you think, I mean, it's different, right? So it's not necessarily, it's, you know, I don't want well, to set up a false binary. It's not better or worse. It's just different. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that we can't say, like, even if it isn't better, I mean, it's just what's going on now. So you can't yeah. ignore it. It's just going to, it's 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 happening. So, um, I, you know, I have to say that my career as an actor and uh, was kind of, you know, I haven't worked under enough of these contracts to be able to sit here and tell you, Netflix stinks, or uh-huh. or Hulu is ripping at people. I don't really know enough about the structure of those contracts and how they work, mm-hmm. um, so I can't really say that it's a it's not fair to actors or it's not fair to us. Or, you know, I'm sure we'd be on strike right now if it was, uh-huh. uh, or if it wasn't. But um, I I think that anything gives people access, and you can watch stuff more and more. Mm-hmm. I mean, I. I, a friend of mine's got this Bill Murray stories documentary out right now. Mikey just watched that and he was yeah. telling me all about it. Right. It's and, and, and it's a great film and he's got, you know, he, he's been fighting to get, uh, you know, distribution and all that. And, and so he, but he keeps poking through and getting uh-huh. one here and getting one here and getting there. And I think Netflix is just the biggest. Yeah. So got. the, the yeah. premise of this do- and I want to watch it. I just didn't, uh, before I came here is it's just people telling story. So Bill Murray to back up. Bill Murray's famous for just showing up at places right. and like hanging out with people. Yeah. And it's just people telling stories of, and Bill's not even really in the movie. And, uh, yeah, it's mostly, it's, I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it's just he's people kind of his... in it, but I don't want to spoiler alert that one because it is a spoiler <laughs> alert, but he's not, I mean, he's the focus of the film, but he's not in it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's really interesting the way it, it really comes upon a pretty interesting point too. And, uh, it's kind of a interesting film to watch for sure. Not only is it funny and mm-hmm. heartwarming and all that stuff and about one of your favorite actors, right. but it's got something to say. Yeah. What was he like to work with? It's so funny. Uh, I, the only thing I took away from him, well, I think I took a lot of things away from him but recently. So recently, maybe it was because 
it was before Penny Marshall died. Mm-hmm. But so um, I was sing- singing to myself, they wanted a league of their own. <laughs> they wanted a league of their own. And so then I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> it's not in the movie. I'm trying to think, and it, and one day it dawned on me <laughs> that Bill Murray was singing that to himself on the day on the set, on Groundhog Day. And he was making fun of the movie. And he thinks Tom Hanks, this is maybe on the QT, but from what I know, Bill Murray at one point or another thought Tom Hanks was kind of doing him, and with good reason, because oh. he was. Um, so he was like poking fun at Tom huh. Hanks and about a girl movie about baseball. I mean, he didn't say the girl thing, yeah. but it was kind of implied. Maybe I'm wrong, but he when he was doing it like Nick Rails, like uh-huh. his you know his character who, who sings song parodies. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, this was Star his theme Wars. song. Yeah, if yep. we get bar wars, yeah. <laughs> they wanted a league of their own. And as soon as you sing that, it's like that's who it's that's the that's totally that song. <laughs> so anyway, uh, just to now that now I'll uh, bore you with the quick story from that is that um, it didn't go very well the first day because the first day the first scene was just him you know going uh, like walking past me. Uh-huh. I go, hey, you think it's gonna be early spring? Uh, you know, and then he didn't have any lines, and he just left and walked right past me. So we had nothing really to no interaction. base. No interaction. There was no button to the scene. There was no nothing. And so everyone could feel it. And so then Harold was like, you know, hmm, what should we do? Bill's like, I don't know. And then, and then they turn to me, and they go, what do you think, Kenny? And I'm like, here's <laughs> my my idols, Bill Murray and, and Harold Ramis are asking me what I think. Well, you know what, guys? It needs something. <laughs> That's what they said. Wow. And they turned and they went, oh, thanks. Wow. Anyway. That could have been your know. moment. You could have become Harold Ramis's muse, and so, instead you right. said nothing. And I said, well, it needs something. So then we kind of cobbled something together where I was kind of talking him down the, you know, I was thinking it is going to be uh, early spring. You know, uh, yeah. I forget exactly what I was saying, but I sort of, you know, went like, ha, ha, because you're leaving and... You know, and then buttoned it, and it was enough for it was fun. Uh-huh. And then we did something else. It kind of went, okay. I, I, I went back to the hotel. I'm like, to my wife, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> they're going to fire me because I, I fucked up, and we didn't finish, and they're going to fire me. And so then the script got put underneath my door around midnight, which meant that I was back the next day. So I went back, and then we did the scene where he throws me up against the thing, and he goes, pork chop. You know, uh-huh. what day is it, pork chop? <laughs> I go, it's February 2nd. It's Groundhog Day, you know, that thing. And uh, after the scene, he goes like, boom, boom, hits me in the chest, and he goes, different guy. <gasps> so I was. Wow. This close to getting fired. And I pulled it out the next day, and then we made it funny. We made some, some funny stuff. And I stayed in, the kid stays in the picture. That's <laughs> a really cool story. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, I was fortunate that we had to do more, and they had shot so much during the day that right. we had to get back. And then, you know, they, it would be too hard to hire somebody from Chicago that late. And, you sure. Know. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Cool. So I think um, we are beginning to wrap up. This was really fun. I feel like I've ne- like I've known you for most of my life, and I've never gotten to like sit down and and hear your your tales of Hollywood. Well, get have more podcasts. I just have the one, <laughs> and it's only middlingly successful. So like I'm just gonna ride this one out. Oh, good. Um, God. So if anybody wanted to, fi- okay, wait. This is what I thought of earlier. If I wanted to find like local heroes, is, it, it, does it live anywhere? I don't know. I don't think so. You can't. So, so these shows that didn't get in a syndication. Yeah. You know, the 85 episodes, 100 episodes, something like that. Um, so something like uh, Local Heroes, I think is pretty hard to find. Here's now, the other problem is is that there's other things named Local Heroes. Oh, yeah, that SEO so is very strong. that screws things up. So like one of the first things I ever did was a pilot for Second City. It was supposed to be the new SCTV. And it was with me and really? S- me and Steve Carell and Ryan Stiles, and it was called uh, 
These are uh, big names to name drop at the end of a podcast. I feel <laughs> like you should front load those. Well, he, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was supposed to be the new Second City. And um, uh, uh, um, where was I going again with this? Uh, you, you see, did... you found the old man thing. <laughs> uh, you were doing a pilot for Second City. It was supposed to be the next SCTV. It was with Ryan Stiles. It was with Stephen Colbert. No, Steve, Carell. Steve Carell. Carell. Oh, um, we were talking about finding something online. SC, being oh, able to oh find that something. one is called Life as We Know It. So That's there's a cool. whole series called Life as We Know It that ran for four years. And so there's on YouTube, there's like four years of, uh-huh. of episodes of Life as We Know It, but not with Ken Campbell and Ryan Stiles and Brad Sherwood, you know. It's, oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, so you, I don't know how you can find that, but I know those, there's sketches from that show are available online. Cool. And um, uh, I don't know if you could find Baby Bob. I haven't, I haven't really looked for it at all. Why not? You didn't, you're not, it's not the thing you're most proud of? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but uh, I know that Herman's Head, you can find some parts of episodes yeah. or whole episodes out there. I should those go back and watch there. that. And then um, we filmed Herman Cain's Head Five, like what was it? Five years ago for a, uh, and I wrote it and um, we uh, produced it. We did it ourselves, and it was on. It's on Funny or Die, but it's also on YouTube. Oh God, I remember. It Herman, was like the whole the cast of Herman's Head. It was wasn't three it? of us. Three of you. But Herman is Herman Cain's head, and it was about him trying to uh, to uh, get his uh, a, a person he worked with trying to get her. In the sack, uh-huh. and uh, and when you, so we did it with like it was Herman, but he had people in his head, and it's like, come on, let's do it. That's the national restaurant show. What are you talking about? We can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really good. Uh, but yeah, uh, so that stuff is uh, available out there. Oh, I cannot believe I almost forgot, Ken. I was mm. um, perus- I was looking at your. Where's my phone? I was looking at your IMDb page. Wow. Oh, okay. And you, w- I'm extremely excited about this but you were in a hallmark christmas movie recently oh yeah and i have a recent obsession with hallmark christmas movies Ah. like i've probably seen 20 of them this year alone really and you are in one with the handsome ghost from a different movie can you tell me all about being in a hallmark christmas movie the guy the main guy what's his name doesn't matter handsome ghost man there's a movie called the spirit of christmas and it's about a literal spirit in christmas it's amazing. <laughs> it's a magical show. Can you tell me what Hallmark Christmas movies are like? Do people take it super seriously, or is it is everybody kind of like, oh, these are fun, like silly, cute movies? Yeah, I'm gonna disappoint you here a little, I guess. Well, so there's not an overwhelming, uh, you know, like oh, th- so this is a Hallmark Christmas movie. You know, it's my, it's like a, it's a movie. It's just a shoot. It's pretty much like every other movie, you know. Um, this handsome ghost. He's not. I don't think he's a ghost in real no, life. He's pretty but it's, handsome. I know. Uh, but the woman, Ashley Avis, uh, is very, very talented. I think she goes by her married name to Winters. But um, Ashley Avis, yeah. She is uh, very talented, and I did that in a movie called Adolescence with her. And um, yeah, there's not, there's no presence there of like somebody from Hallmark. Oh, uh huh. You know, it's just the independent producers, and okay. so it's. It was just like any other movie. (sighs) But I do, when I'm working on a Christmas movie, I do walk around and remind everybody that I was Santa Claus and Home Alone. Sure. I'd hate for them to forget. Yeah. I just, I need to throw my weight around. Do you just show up in full Santa regalia? You're like, oh, what? This old thing? I just had it in my closet. I still have yet to be hired to play Santa in anything else ever. Since That's absurd. The, since the highest grossing comedy of all time. You're the iconic <laughs> Santa. <laughs> Uh, I really wish you had some better gossip for me, Ken, but that's fine. Okay, <laughs> Ken, thank you so much All for your right. time. Anything you want to plug? Are you on I'll Twitter? I'll just uh, remind, well, I'm Ken H. Campbell at Twitter, and uh, you can find me there. And uh, I don't do a whole lot there, but sometimes some of my uh, the trailers or things like that are up there. But mm-hmm. Wonder Park for sure. Yeah. April, uh, March 15th, March, April 14th. Don't go April 14th. Go March 15th to Wonder Park. Or both. Don't discourage people. Maybe it'll still be open. (laughs) 
Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, thank you very much for for being on my uh, weird show. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, nice. guys. Um, I'll talk to you next week. Nice weird show. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.